Beams, y'all. My name is Andrew DeFi, a.k.a. the Gorilla Poet Laureate, a.k.a. the Hoodie God, a.k.a. Spitting Quarantino, a.k.a. I wear my sunglasses at night indoors because my eyes are as sensitive as my heart is, y'all. It is September 15th, 9 p.m. West Coast time. We are back with another episode of Mast Up, the Internet's favorite community help live stream, where tonight we are going on another educational adventure to gain clarity on medical issues impacting our communities in the time of Rona. On tonight's episode, we're going to talk all things booster shots with a leading expert in the field. We've got practicing HIV infectious disease specialist and internist, epidemiologist slash journalist slash filmmaker, Dr. Celine Gounder joining us tonight, y'all. Yeah, and we are also going to talk the latest vaccine mandates coming out of Washington and a new study that says our unvaccinated family is 10 times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID. Not only that, we are going to go upstream and cover some new changes being made in healthcare education to address structural racism in the field. We got a packed episode tonight, y'all. Stay tuned. It all starts now. So last Thursday, President Joe Biden signed an executive order requiring all federal executive branch employees to get vaccinated. This order affects more than 150,000 workers in California and is even more in depth than Governor Newsom's original order for California in July. The governor's order allowed most public employees an option to take a COVID test instead of getting vaccinated. Here's a snippet of what the president said direct from the White House. My job as president is to protect all Americans. So tonight, I'm announcing that the Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule to require all employers with 100 or more employees that together employ over 80 million workers to ensure their workforces are fully vaccinated or show a negative test at least once a week. Some of the biggest companies are already requiring this. United Airlines, Disney, Tyson's Food, and even Fox News. Already, I've announced, we'll be requiring vaccinations at all nursing home workers who treat patients on Medicare and Medicaid because I have that federal authority. Tonight, I'm using that same authority to expand that to cover those who work in hospitals home health care facilities, or other medical facilities. A total of 17 million health care workers. Next, I will sign an executive order that will now require all executive branch federal employees to be vaccinated, all. And I've signed another executive order that will require federal contractors to do the same. If you want to work with the federal government and do business with us, get vaccinated. If you want to do business with the federal government, vaccinate your workforce. And tonight, I'm removing one of the last remaining obstacles that make it difficult for you to get vaccinated. The Department of Labor will require employers with 100 or more workers to give those workers paid time off to get vaccinated. No one should lose pay in order to get vaccinated or take a loved one to get vaccinated. So we've been hearing a lot about new variants and seeing a lot of arguments about the effectiveness of the vaccine in the wake of Delta and friends. The U.S. released some new studies Friday that showed the vaccines remain highly effective against hospitalizations and death, even as the Delta birth variant was doing her thing. One study tracked over 600,000 cases in 13 states from April to mid-July and found that those who were unvaccinated were 4.5 times more likely than their vaccinated counterparts to get infected, 10 times more likely to be hospitalized, and 11 times more likely to die from COVID. 
three studies found unvaccinated Americans were 10 times more likely to be hospitalized, 11 times more likely to die from COVID. Dr. Ali Raja is the executive vice chair of emergency medicine at MGH. Dr. Raja, thanks for your time. Good to see you. Thanks, Ben. All right. So first of all, as we talk about the waning effectiveness of those shots, what does this new data say to you about where we are right now in this pandemic? Well, Ben, Erica really nailed the, the key numbers. This new data shows that unvaccinated Americans are almost five times more likely to get infected than people who have had the vaccine, 10 times more likely to get hospitalized, 11 times more likely to die. We've seen the vaccine numbers kind of wane over the past couple of weeks and months. And so I really hope that these data prompt more people to get vaccinated. And we do know that's important. People across the country, they're still being hospitalized at an alarming rate in some states. So what are you seeing in Boston? And what do we know about the kinds of people who are still getting quite sick from the virus? Erica, I've worked all Labor Day weekend and I worked a bunch of shifts this week. And the people that are still getting sick, I've got to tell you, the vast majority of the ones that I'm hospitalizing still haven't been vaccinated. I'm seeing young otherwise totally healthy people who I'm admitting to the hospital just because of the fact that they didn't have a vaccine. Now, I have admitted a couple of people who did get vaccinated with breakthrough cases, but they were older and they've had other illnesses as well. All right, so from the older folks who might still be at risk to the very youngest among us who are obviously still unvaccinated, any kid under 12, we both are parents, I know you're a parent as well. Back to school is now fully underway. What are you gonna watch for as a doctor, as a parent, we know a lot of districts across the state are doing that surveillance testing when it comes to COVID and kids this fall. Are our kids more at risk now that they're back indoors in those classrooms? Yeah, Ben, they, they really are. They're at a little bit higher risk. And as you said, the schools are a lot of the schools are doing surveillance testing. I know my kids got swabbed this week as well. I'm really worried about positive cases in kids and hospitalizations, especially when it gets to the point where they're shutting down classrooms. Last week, we had 250,000 new cases of COVID in kids in the country. And earlier this week, there were almost 2,400 kids hospitalized. So I'm really worried that our kids who have already had so much uncertainty with their schooling might have classrooms shut down again. And I really hope we get those vaccines to them soon. Me too. We do too. <laughs> Dr. Raja, thanks as always for being with us from MGH. This story comes to us from Jeff Lagasse from healthcarefinancenews.com, and it's entitled, Ending Racism in Healthcare Often Begins with Medical Education and is the Target of a New National Project. To say that race has been a much debated topic during the pandemic would be an understatement. Racial tensions were hitting a boiling point in the U.S. even before the world shut down due to COVID-19, and now the pandemic has highlighted racial disparities that exist in many facets of American life including in healthcare. Bias and inequity can be found in many areas of the industry. One that has been overlooked is medical education, which can oftentimes result in clinical trainees internalizing implicit bias, but a new initiative is looking to change that. Project Impact is a collaboration between clinical decision support system company Visual DX, the Skin of Color Society, and the New England Journal of Medicine Group. Project Impact, Improving Medicine's Power to Address Care and Treatment, looks to bridge gaps in knowledge and improve outcomes for people of color. Initially focusing on the field of dermatology, two goals are to raise awareness and adoption of educational and clinical resources with an eye toward bolstering clinicians' ability to accurately diagnose disease in black and brown skin and to improve health equity. See, one of the ways racism comes into play is through implicit bias, and there are different ways in which this can manifest itself. Sometimes it may be viewpoints or beliefs that clinicians don't realize they're acting on when treating people of different backgrounds. There's also bias within medical education, said dermatologist Dr. Nada Elbaluk. Visual DX's director of clinical impact said, People can be trained and educated on diseases in a way that is not representative of all backgrounds, and that can also lead to various kinds of cognitive biases. Project Impact was created in part because one of the best means of eliminating racial and implicit bias in medicine is targeting the source. 
medical education, where the bedrock of a clinician's professional philosophy is often set. I think the problem has been overlooked for so long, people didn't realize that medical education was not diverse enough in its representation of people of different backgrounds. I think it went on like that for so long that people just became used to that as a baseline, said Elba Luke. It's been highlighted much more significantly now, which is important and much needed. Hopefully institutions are now reevaluating their curricula and educational resources to make sure that they are minimizing bias and that they are representative of the diverse spectrum of patients and our world. To change the narrative, the project is pulling from a large and diverse collection of medical images, putting them in the hands of more future and current providers and giving people a more representative, diverse educational resource from which to learn. El Baluk expects this will have downstream effects on improving disparities and outcomes. The project is also working on creating educational tools like teaching sets with imaging that people can use and share within their own institutions and networks to help educate others. The idea is to create problem sets, questions, and other methods to engage people and educate themselves. On top of all of that is a library of resources on Project Impact's webpage featuring articles related to racial bias and health disparities, as well as textbooks on ethnic skin, skin of color, and other topics within dermatology, such as hair and nail issues across different skin types. The project hopes to activate its blog soon, which will highlight skin of color conditions, as well as leaders in medicine who are making an impact in improving health disparities. Project Impact is also promoting resources like a patient-facing website called SkinSight and a mobile app called ISA, both free and publicly available, that will attempt to engage and educate patients directly. So for a little while now, we've been hearing a lot of conversation about COVID vaccine booster shots. As with all things COVID related, there are a lot of opinions and a lot of information and misinformation out there. Tonight, we're going to cut through that with our guest, Celine Gounder. But before that, let's get into a little of the science behind the vaccine booster shot with CBC News out of Canada. It doesn't take much for Andrea Horowitz to get sick. She's been on medication to suppress her immune system ever since her liver transplant. I never went anywhere without washing my hands or, you know, I used my feet to open doors. So when she was offered a third COVID-19 shot... They said I could come, I ran. Booster shots can be used in a few ways, typically as a third dose of the same vaccine for people with compromised immune systems or for those with waning immunity, such as older people or those who had two shots early in the pandemic. Or it could be as a new vaccine redesigned specifically for emerging variants of the coronavirus, such as Delta. So we're all waiting for the data from Pfizer and Moderna that will tell us whether you get a better antibody level out of the out of a Delta specific booster versus a regular booster. The vaccines approved so far were designed to target the original version of the coronavirus and its spike protein, which it uses to penetrate our defenses. But that spike protein has undergone mutations, creating new variants, which researchers have now genetically sequenced. Then you have the sequence of this new uh, uh, spike protein. You have that, uh, you can just swap out that sequence uh, and then uh, use that vaccine. The worry is, without a new booster shot, we'll see more breakthrough infections. But so far, researchers say Canada is doing better than other countries, partially because of our delay between doses, which resulted in a stronger immune response. We do potentially have the luxury of time to wait and see what the data from elsewhere is telling us. Now that said, though, we need to continue monitoring uh, breakthrough cases with Delta. For some Canadians, no amount of protection is too much. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. 
Our guest tonight is a practicing HIV infectious disease specialist and internist, epidemiologist, journalist, and filmmaker. From November 9th, 2020 to January 20th, 2021, Dr. Gounder served on the Biden-Harris Transition COVID-19 Advisory Board, so she knows a little bit about this. She is also the CEO and founder of Just Human Productions, a nonprofit multimedia organization, and she is a frequent expert guest on CNN, CBS, NBC, BBC, Dr. Oz, and Oprah Prime. Yeah, Oprah. That's right. In 2017, People Magazine named her one of the 25 women changing the world. And in 2021, InStyle Magazine named her one of the 50 women making the world a better place. Y'all, welcome Dr. Celine Gounder to the show. <laughs> We have Dr. Selena Gounder with us today. How are you doing, first and foremost? Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. So let's jump right into it. The, the Biden administration recently announced that COVID-19 booster shots will be available September 20th for adults who receive Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Do you recommend that all adults receive this third shot or is it mostly for immunocompromised folks? There is very good data that people who are highly immunocompromised, and when I say highly immunocompromised, I'm talking about patients who've had solid organ transplants, who have AIDS, who are taking highly immunosuppressive drugs because they have conditions uh, like cancer or rheumatologic diseases. These kinds of patients who are highly immunocompromised do benefit from an additional dose of vaccine. Many of them do not respond to the first and second dose of the vaccine. And by giving them a third dose, we increase their chances of responding, of developing an immune response. The issue is that still many of them, maybe half of them, will still not develop an immune response. And so they really do need to be very vigilant about implementing other protective measures. So that includes masking, uh, socializing uh, outdoors as much as possible when they're indoors, to do so in well-ventilated spaces where you have air filtration uh, and people are preferably masking as well. And really all of those people around these immunocompromised persons need to be taking similar measures, getting vaccinated, wearing masks, et cetera, to protect their loved ones who are immunocompromised. The other groups in which there is clear benefit from giving an additional dose of vaccine are people living in nursing homes where we have seen uh, what we call breakthrough infections or infections after vaccination, where we have seen those infections turn bad is in nursing homes where people have developed severe disease, hospitalization and death. Um, that said, these infections are resulting from caregivers who are not vaccinated or visitors who are not vaccinated, bringing the virus in from the community. And so vaccinating caregivers, making sure that visitors are also vaccinated will do a lot more to protect people living in, in nursing homes. And then finally, the elderly do seem to also benefit from an additional dose of vaccine. Just like the rest of your body, your immune system ages over time and your immune system at the age of 80 is not what it was at the age of 20. And so these folks, just like highly immunosuppressed people, don't uh, respond as well to vaccination and would benefit from an additional dose. So that's for Pfizer and Moderna. For people who received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is there any data indicating that those individuals will need a booster shot as well? So uh, the Johnson & Johnson folks are looking at different regimens of their vaccine. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was given FDA emergency use authorization as a low dose, single dose. But J&J &J is also studying high dose, single dose, two doses of low and high dose. And that data is expected any day now. I think that'll be what really directs our um, guidance with respect to how to best vaccinate people using the J&J &J vaccine. Beautiful, thank you so much. That's good to know. We'll keep an eye out for, for that data. And, and I mean, while we're, while we're talking data, can we talk about some of the data that supports the need for adults to get a third dose? 
Well, there are a couple things that we look at. One is, is there an increase of uh, severe disease hospitalization and death? Uh, and then we also look at uh, measures in the lab, so things like your antibody levels. The problem is antibody level levels uh, are a snapshot in time. They don't reflect what will happen if you're re-exposed to a virus. They only reflect what your antibodies are at the, on that particular day. Uh, and we know that antibody levels will uh, shoot up after you get vaccinated and they go back down over time. The rest of your immune system, however, is still primed, is still remembering what that vaccine looked like. And so is still ready to respond if you're re-exposed to the virus. Um, so in some senses, what's most useful to look at here is, do you see an increase in severe disease, hospitalization, and death? And the good news is that for the general population, we are not seeing that. Those three specific groups I mentioned are the one are the, the groups in which we do see an increased risk of severe disease, hospitalization, and death. But we are not seeing that in the general population. COVID vaccines remain over 90, 95% protected against hospitalization in the general population. So a lot of a lot of folks are wondering, you know, just about the, the length. Of, uh, of of some of these vaccines, right? Will will immunity wane if you don't receive the booster eight months after being vaccinated? Is that something we know yet? Yeah, I really wouldn't uh, worry too much about that. I think the Biden administration is under a lot of pressure to make uh, additional doses of vaccine available, but the groups that really need to be uh, going out sooner than later to get those additional doses are, again, highly immunocompromised persons, persons living in nursing homes, and the elderly. These are the folks where we're seeing um, breakthrough disease. So disease in people who've been vaccinated, not just breakthrough infections. Uh, and so that's an important distinction to make here. For the average person, um, I think you may eventually need an extra dose, but you don't need to rush out and get one right now. Thank you so much for that clarity. That helps so much. Um, now, some global health advocates argue that pushing for a third dose in the U.S. will undermine efforts to vaccinate those in low-income countries. Should booster shots be a main priority for the U.S., or is global vaccination a more urgent issue? You know, I think something that people really are still very confused about is they think that vaccination works at an individual level. That's not how vaccines work uh, in terms of preventing infection. They work best at preventing infection at a population level. Uh, and so that means we need to get people who are not yet vaccinated vaccinated. That's people here in the United States as well as abroad. Uh, we know that people who are not vaccinated, the, the virus will continue transmitting, spreading, mutating in unvaccinated people. And that is precisely what led to the emergence of the Delta variant. So as long as we have people out there who are not vaccinated, who are not well protected, we are going to see the emergence of new variants that could threaten all of us. So aside from the booster shots, we're still struggling in the U.S. due to a lot of misinformation surrounding the vaccines. Uh, for individuals watching who may be hesitant about getting vaccinated, what can you tell them about safety and, and the efficiency of the vaccines? So yesterday, the FDA granted full approval to the Pfizer vaccine. So they have vetted the vaccine, made sure it is safe, it is effective. They have done uh, inspections of the manufacturing plants that produce the vaccine. Uh, and so this is the gold standard of vaccine safety and effectiveness really around the world. So we have proven that for the Pfizer vaccine. We also have ample data to uh, demonstrate the same as the case with the Moderna and J&J &J vaccines. Those companies are in the process of submitting their data to the FDA for their stamp of approval as well. Um, over 4 billion doses of vaccine have been given around the world at this point. Uh, and we have not seen significant safety issues. Uh, in the United States, that's several million doses of vaccine uh, have been, 100 million doses of vaccine have been given in the United States. Again, we have not seen significant safety issues here. And the vaccines are highly effective in preventing 
severe disease, hospitalization, and death. We give vaccines to prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death, not to prevent the common cold. And the vaccines are working as they are intended to work. They are preventing 90 to 95% of hospitalizations that would have occurred uh, due to COVID. And so this is really a win. We, you know, many people at the beginning of the pandemic compared COVID to the flu. To be very clear, COVID is not the flu. Uh, many, many times more people have died from COVID in the past year. Over 600,000 people have died from COVID in the United States in the past year. A bad flu season is a tenth that number of people. So these are not on anywhere near the same scale. But with vaccination, you could turn COVID into something less serious, more like the flu or the common cold. And that would be a huge win here because if it's not so serious, if it's not killing people the way it has been, you can return to a more normal life. You can reopen the economy. You can socialize normally again. And vaccines are really the way to get there. Absolutely. Well, thank you for all of that. I have one last question for you, and it's the question that we ask everyone on this here show because we stay hunting joy. Where are you finding your joy today? I am finding my joy speaking to people like you, uh, you know, as a, as a infectious disease specialist and epidemiologist who's been on the front lines of this and also on the uh, front lines, not just treating patients, but educating the public about these issues. Any opportunity I have to spread the word, to help people understand that the vaccines are safe and effective, that our route uh, out of the pandemic is through vaccination, that gives me joy. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming and, and sharing some information with us and providing the clarification that you did. That helps us all so much. And uh, just continued, uh, continued blessings in, in what you're doing. And thank you. You're welcome. Stay safe and be well. And that brings us to the end of another episode of Masked Up, the internet's favorite community health live stream. Find us on YouTube, Facebook, and anywhere streams are live. We want to thank you all for tuning in because this would be really awkward without y'all. You know what I'm saying? Thank you to the team of folks that helps put this show together every other week. Catch us back on the 29th with another episode. And until then, wash your hands, wear your mask, and remember, health is well. Get your bag. <laughs>